Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we welcome you to the second in the series of webinars presented in conjunction with the Indian Heritage Center's um, Sikhs in Singapore, A Story Untold Special Exhibition. This exhibition has been co-created co with the Sikh community in Singapore and focuses on the history and culture of Singapore Sikhs. To complement the exhibition, this series of webinars introduces facets of the Sikh community's heritage from the Indian subcontinent and Singapore. Academics and experts will share lesser known aspects of the community's history and culture through these talks, which will be held every month. Today, we are joined by Surinder Pal Singh, who will be sharing with us the events and notable impact of Guru Tegh Bahadur, the ninth guru of the Sikh faith. Moderating the discussion uh, that will follow the talk, uh, we have with us Simranjit Singh. Um, Simranjit Singh is the CEO of Gardan Health Asia, Middle East and Africa, uh, which is a cancer diagnostics company. Uh, he has 15 years of senior management experience in Asia Pacific, working with biopharma, diagnostics and medical device companies for their R&D business expansion and growth strategies for the region. He also sits on the board of the Oversight Committee for the National Health Innovation under the Ministry of Health Singapore. His passion for movies has allowed him to be involved as an associate producer for a Hollywood film, Hotel Mumbai, and as an executive producer for an award-winning documentary, The Saint Soldier, which is the story of the first Sikh in Singapore, Bhai Maharaj Singh. Simran is an active volunteer and a well-known face in the Sikh community, and currently serves on the Central Sikh Gurdwara Board and the Sikh Advisory Board. Simran, could I invite you to introduce today's talk and our speaker today as well, please. Thank you. Thank you, Malvika, um, and welcome everyone, Sashrikal, uh, to the second in the uh, uh, web webinar uh, presentation of the series. Today's talk is entitled The Life and Legacy of Guru Tegh Bahadur, the ninth guru of the Sikh religion. Guru Tegh Bahadurji was born in May 1621. This month commemorates Guru Tegh Bahadur's 400th birth anniversary. This talk will explore his important contributions to the development of the Sikh faith and beyond. Notable for his stance against religious persecution, Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji was arrested in 1675 for being a threat to the Mughal Empire Aurangzeb. He was tortured during the four months he was imprisoned and was executed in Delhi. His sacrifice is an, an important event and milestone in Sikh history. Today, we have with us Surinder Paul Singh Ji. He is a researcher in Sikh studies. He works at the Sikh Research Institute in the US, where he develops curriculum, presentations, and research papers, and delivers online courses and webinars on Sikh theology, culture, and history. Surinder Paul holds a master's degree in English and religious studies. He feels his work helps him explore his roots and identity deeper giving him a stronger sense of purpose. He's particularly fascinated by Sikh theology, which provides new perspectives and experiences to observe the world through. He is heavily involved with various religious, educational and human development organizations. He currently lives in Canada with his wife and two sons. For this session, we will have a Q&A after the talk. You may leave your questions in the Q&A button that you see right at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to uh, ask your questions and we'll address them right at the end of the session. Without further ado, let me turn it over to Surinder Apology. Please address, thank you. Good morning, everyone uh, in Singapore. Uh, hope everyone is doing well and they can see my screen. Samindji, can you see my screen? If you could just... Uh... Yes, I can. Thank you. Go ahead. So thank you for inviting me to this forum. Uh, as Sam just mentioned, the presentation is about the life and legacy of Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib, the ninth guru in the line of 10 Sikh gurus in Sikhi. So uh, the Sikh community is, you know, is celebrating the 400th year anniversary of Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib this year. And the focus is on the, of course, legacy of the Guru. Uh, so while we yearn to learn from, you know, the Guru's message, 
you often fall into the trap of uh, you know conceiving the guru personality in a you know set frame of stereotypical ideas uh, sometimes we stereotype you know just to make sense of things around us and to you know things uh, uh, in a specific frame of mind occasionally we do so out of you know convenience uh, to create a you know if i may say pseudo reality that suits you know our world views or perspectives uh, so guru tegh bahadur sahib's uh, life uh, sketch is one such example of our you know uh, compartmentalized uh, world view even though the guru played a, a very active role in the community and gave you know martyrdom for the freedom of life and expression he is still portrayed as a uh, we do not realize that you know each of uh, the guru's responses was dynamic and based on the, the divine principles of love justice humility and you know forgiveness so since the you know general information regarding the life of the guru is pretty much uh, available on the in the public domain and it becomes really mundane to just go through someone's life and what they did uh, what i would like to do here is to you know shed some light on the guru's personality which is usually portrayed in a very different light because of certain events in his life uh, and how you know his revelations in the scripture which is the guru himself are interpreted uh, he is often you know seen as a recluse as i just mentioned uh who mostly you know stayed you know uh, to himself so while most of the divine oriented people are like that uh, the problem uh, with this image is uh, that it stereotypes the divine and the dynamic personality of the guru uh, uh, uh and boxes it uh, in this presentation uh, uh through various engagements of the guru uh, we will see what it means to be a divinely person through some of his you know uh, interactions with the family uh, with the community and the outside world uh, we will take four case studies to demonstrate that uh, but before that uh, we will look have a quick like look at the at the at his you know earlier life so so the guru was born on 1st april uh, 1621 in amritsar he ascended to the guruship with own of kunanak sahib's house founder of sikhi in 1664 in the village called bakala where he spent uh, close to 20 hour, 20 years of his life before you know becoming the guru so before he became the guru he had moved to bakala on the instruction of his father the sixth guru guru har gobind sahib uh, this kept him away from the public gaze and is partially the reason why he is seen as a recluse uh finally he was martyred in delhi uh, in 1675 for speaking up for the right to freedom of belief and expression at the age of uh, 54 so <clears throat> you know as i just mentioned earlier you know him being seen as a recluse was you know partially because of his you know solitude loving nature and his staying away from the public gaze in bakala and texts like the one in front of you contribute to this perception about the guru uh, this one by a celebrated sikh author uh, uh, gyani gyan singh from the 19th century informs that you know guru served the sikhs uh, immensely and uh, but mostly stayed away from the public in a state of you know detachment from the world uh, but what people fail to notice uh, is his lifestyle there uh we've noticed in the previous slide there is a mention of you know him serving uh community actively here another sikh author records uh in his mid 18th century work uh that the guru used to do go you know horse riding and hunting expeditions on hunting expeditions interestingly uh, uh his you know this shatters the you know multiple stereotypes and myths regarding you know divine oriented people or you know simply uh so you know one uh, particular episode that usually gets overlooked in all this is the guru's early life uh when he took part in the battle of kartarpur in 1634 when he was merely 13 years old in the battle he along with the sixth uh, guru guru hargobind sahib you know took on shahjahan's army 
led by Kale Khan, the, the governor of Peshawar at that time. Uh, six won that battle, and Guru Tegh Bhada Sahib is known to have shown you know, exemplary valor and great feat uh, with his sword in that uh, battle, because of which his name was uh, changed to Tegh Bhada, the sword warrior. The tradition informs that you know his earlier name was Tiagmal, one who is a renunciate because he had a very you know drawn uh, innerly drawn personality. So you know this shows how dynamic you know divine loving people are, uh, which is you know being inward is the, in their inherent nature, but still they are very you know outgoing in the sense that they that they see the divine in the entire world around them. Uh, so this shows that you know. Such stereotypes do not necessarily stick to people who are, you know, connected with the divine. Uh, simply, people show, you know, varied and, you know, dynamic uh, responses to situations based on uh, the need of the hour. And hence, you know, looking at the life, at, at their life from a skewed, you know, mindset is our folly, not theirs. So, uh, you know, after becoming the, uh, uh, the guru, uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib worked to further build and strengthen the community, uh, but he faced many detractors, some of whom were, you know, even violent and undermined the Sikh institution. So in the next few slides, we'll look at examples of how the Guru dealt with the swords and uh, aggression in his own sphere of influence. Uh, we will explore the Guru's uh, responses and examine how his approach dynamically you know changed based on the issues and the parties involved to understand the guru's reaction to you know the various uh, situations of progression we will take four examples uh, each from one each from family uh, the community and two from the external world which includes one of them includes his martyrdom uh, which is you know one of the uh, major uh, features the focus of our our, our presentation today so first we'll go, uh, we'll look at the familiar discourse as an example. As soon as, you know, Guru Harkishan Sahib, who was the eighth Guru of the six, left the, uh, the earthly realm and informed the community that the next Guru was at Bakala, uh, many imposters, you know, cropped up in the village of Bakala where the Guru, the ninth Guru was. You know, these imposters set up their seats at Bakala to, you know, lay claims, uh, to the divine throne of the Guru Nanak, uh, the Sikh house. Uh, there were around 22, you know, major claimants. Among them, the prominent ones were the Minas of Amritsar and many imposters from the Todi clan. So the Minas were the followers of uh, the guy named Prithi Chand. He was the eldest son of the fourth Guru, Guru Ram Das Sahib. And he started his own parallel line after the fourth Guru selected uh, his, younger, uh, his, his younger son, Guru Arjan Sahib, to succeed him. And among the Sodis, which is the, uh, the third uh, listed here, uh, one of the significant claimants was Tirmal, who, uh, who proved to be the biggest troublemaker. So in the next uh, slide, I'll tell you who Tirmal was. So Tirmal was, if you can see the, uh, the, gra the, gra the graphic here, you can see Tirmal was the elder son of Baba Gurditta, who in turn was the eldest son of Guru Te Hargobind Sahib. So uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib, the ninth Guru, uh, at the bottom, if you notice, was the son of Guru Hargobind Sahib, the sixth Guru. And uh, Baba Gurditta was the sibling of Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib. And Tirmal, the, the, one of the biggest troublemakers, was the son of the eldest son of the eldest son of Guru Hargobind Sahib. He was essentially the the nephew of Tegh Bahadur Sahib. <clears throat> uh, his major, uh, yeah, you know, his claim to guruship was uh, that he had the original Adi Granth, this original Sikh scripture, uh, which Pai Gurdas wrote under the supervision of the fifth guru. Uh, and he had the custody of that original scripture. And also the fact that he was the eldest son of the eldest son of the sixth guru. Uh, so that was his another, he, he thought that he was the crown prince, that divine thrones or divine principles uh, do not really care about, you know, morality, ethics or principles. They're only about uh, inheriting, you know, power, uh, which he was obviously mistaken. 
So consequently, you know, uh, Tirmal was one of the many claimants sitting in Bakala before Makhan Shah Rabana, a Sikh trader, discovered uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib, the ninth Guru Bakala. Uh, to establish himself, Tirmal, uh, you know, ran a parallel court. Uh, he hired, you know, courtiers to serve him in order to, you know, put up a show. But despite uh, this, the Guru was discovered by Makhan Shah. That's another story. We can't really go into these uh, specific stories and otherwise the presentation will be really long. So my uh, agenda is to focus on the attitude of the Guru, how he dealt with this God, that we get directions from it and on how to live a more harmonious and you know, more uh, peaceful life. So, excuse me. By this, the Guru you know, was discovered by Makunta Ravana and then identified by Baba Gurditta, who was the head priest of the Guru's court, and then by the Prime Minister of the Guru's court. Well, they offered Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib the royal regalia, and thus Guru was finally anointed as the Guru in the Bhagavad Once Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib was established as the Guru, uh, after 20 years of staying in, you know, in Bakala alone, uh, the Fe Gurus started slowly leaving away when they realized that they don't, don't, don't have a chance since you know, the Guru has been found now and the Sikhs have started going to him and, you know, following him. But Tirmal was the only one, you know, who remained adamant and stayed put. He, you know, he continued to, you know, run his, uh, you know, battle court. So, uh, you know, the Guru being anointed as the Guru didn't really stop him uh, from, you know, continuing his court. He, his court. He, he was very dissatisfied. Uh, his hunger really, you know, uh, kept him going. So he wanted to sit on the throne of Guru Nanak Sahib's house. He hired a, so on his quest for that, he he hired a rogue uh, mercenary named Siha. He further, you know, engaged people to eliminate Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib. So one day when the Guru's court was not in session uh, and the attendees had left, the mercenaries, you know, attacked the Guru. A few Sikhs who were still in the, in the presence of the Guru, they fought the mercenaries. While the you know other six went went away, they returned carrying the commotion. Uh, during this incident, uh, Tirmal shot the guru, uh, but the attack was foiled and the guru you know only received a bullet scratch. Uh, so, uh, he survived. Meanwhile, you know Tirmal's men you know looted uh, six offering and other things from the guru's court before they before they ran away. But the six chased the a man of Tirmal and his party up to his dwelling where he was staying and took away everything. They outnumbered them and including including the offerings uh, which they had looted. Uh, but they also happened to uh, bring back the Kartar Puri view, the original scripture which was lying with Tirmal uh, and other belongings of you know Tirmal. Interestingly, we need to see what happens you know when they when they return to the Guru with all the belong offerings of the Sikh court, as well as the Sikh scripture, which was actually originally lying with Tirmal and the belongings of the Tirmal. So, you know, uh, when the Sikhs returned with the offerings and the Qatar Puri bead and other things, the, you know, Sikh tradition beautifully preserves uh, the Guru's response when he saw uh, the Sikhs return with, you know, Tirmal's belongings. He states, you know, Tirmal did not do the right thing in the first court here in front of you by suppressing. Gurbilas. Uh, he says, he, you know, he didn't do the right thing, but are we doing the right thing by, you know, looking at taking away his belongings? You know, in addition to that, there's another, uh, you know, record, uh, which, which, which basically records the, uh, uh, you know, the, the advice offered by the Guru to the Sikhs. Uh, it is by Kavi Sankok Singh. Uh, the Guru asked the Sikhs, in which the Guru asked the Sikhs to, you know, forgive uh, Thirumal and return all his belongings and what he had looted from the, from the, you know, the Guru's court. Since Gurbani, you know, in the sixth situation, if, uh, you know, all, all, all those who are aware of it, they know that the word of the Guru, the revelation of the Guru is supreme. The word of the Guru, the revelation of the Guru itself is considered the Guru, the prophet. So for them, you know, the sixth scripture was really valuable. So, you know, uh, for that reason, some Sikhs might have, you know, insisted on, you know, keeping just the scripture. You know, when the Guru asked them to, you know, return everything, Tirmal, they might have insisted, you know, oh Guru, 
let's please keep the scripture. You no, know, it belongs to us. But then the guru asked the six to return even that, you know, uh, since the wisdom of the revelation uh, was already manifesting in the personal. So see how graciously, you know, guru responded to uh, a personal attack uh, on his work. It's worth noting that, you know, sometimes, you know, we end up uh, distorting the Guru's personality or seeing only a part of it based on how the Guru is described in history or in certain historical episodes. Uh, the Guru's humility in forgiving uh, Tirmal may be seen as a sign of having a softer personality. Uh, we do similar things, you know, with other Guru personalities, Guru persons as well. Uh, when we try to, you know, praise them by attaching, <clears throat> you know, earthly human qualities to them, like saying, you know, the Guru was a great poet, the Guru was very peaceful and gentle, or the Guru was very brave and warrior, brave warrior, and the Guru was a skilled general, you know, such things. But the Guru, you know, being divine-like and being perfect, you know, is all of these things at the same time and still above all these, you know, worldly qualities. So consequently, we can find many parallels of what happened in Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib's the ninth Guru's court in the other Gurus uh, from the Guru period. One such example is of Pai Datuji. Pai Datuji was the son of the second Guru, uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib, uh, who did not like the fact that the Guru Shri went again to Pai, uh, Guru Amrita Sahib, the third Guru, who wasn't the son of the second Guru. So, you know, just like you know, Tirumal thought he was the crown prince, so he deserves the guruship. There were other, uh, you know, children of the gurus who thought just by virtue of being children of the guru, they had the right on the guru. So, Payatu was one of them. He kicked on Guru Amar Das Sahib, who happened to be very old at that time. So, so he went to the court of the guru. He kicked the guru while the court was in session, and uh, the devotees was always were obviously shocked. The Guru, you know, got up in his uh, grace and, you know, touched the feet of Pai Dhatu. And, uh, you know, uh, he, he said, you know, I'm an old guy. My bones have really hardened. So you kicking me, kicking me might have hurt your, you know, your foot. Let me massage it. That's the level of, you know, humility, the third uh, Nanak, Guru Amar Das. So we have parallels of that, that it's not just about, despite of being a sovereign, having been sitting on the throne of Guru Nanak Sahib's uh, house, Guru, you know, had the humility to get up in front of the disciples, the followers, and didn't have any issues saying that, you know what, let me still serve you. So that's the level of humility we see in all the Gurus, not just Guru Tegh Bala Sahib. So it will be a mistake to think that the Guru's personality was soft just because he pardoned or forgives. Uh, that's how the Guru's personality is. So that's one example of, you know, how Guru... Uh, did we get the disconnected from Malika? Uh, yes, I think we did. Uh, you'll... Okay, that's fine. Yes, maybe ask you to start uh, resharing uh, your screen. Sure. So right now it's not sharing. That's fine. Yeah. Apologies for the uh, disruption. Uh, can you guys see the screen now? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. So where did where did I get disconnected? Right at the end of the last uh, slide, as you were saying that the uh, uh, forgiveness is in, uh, within... Right, in the nature of the good. That's fine. Of the good. So, yeah. so my point was that, you know, this is the personal example where, you know, Guru forgave uh, when someone showed aggression, aggression uh, you know, on his person when the attack was posted. So next we see example of uh, his community life, how he responded to when people attacked an institution. So after the death of Meherban, you know, a descendant of Prithichan, uh, we just covered, just talked about in the 
Ismail, who was the uh, son of uh, the fourth. His descendant, uh, Harji Mina, was installed in 1640. Harji Mina now controlled, during the time of Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib, Harji Mina controlled the, the, if you call it, the Vatican of the States, uh, Sri Harmandar Sahib, what many people know as, non-Sikhs know as Golden Temple now. Uh, there was no gold at that time on the temple on the Sikh Dwara. That was something that was put uh, during Maja Maharaj's time. So, yeah, the absence of the coming back to the story, the absence of the sixth, uh, seventh, and the eighth guru from the region helped the Minas, uh, you know, establish control over the Gurdwaras, the six in institutions. Uh, you know, tradition forms us that, you know, the, that when Guru Tegh Bada Sahib came to Amritsar to pay a visit, around 1664, the priests, out of jealousy and insecurity, uh, Harji Mina, uh, closed the doors of Paramandar Sahib on the Guru, at the behest of Harji Mina. So the Guru did not, the interesting part is that the Guru did not leave immediately. He waited for a while uh, near Kaatak Sahib, in front of uh, the Paramandar Sahib, uh, before he got up to leave the city, the place where the Guru actually sat and waited is now called Tham Sahib, the pillar of patience, uh, where the Guru actually sat. So the Guru waited there for a while instead of leaving immediately. And then he uh, left the city. So on his way out of the city, you know, the Guru was greeted by a woman, a you know, devotee named Mata Hariya from Valla village, uh, who took him to her place and served, uh, you know, served, served, him, served him really well. When the Sikhs came to know about the, you know, incident with the help of Makhan Shah, the, the trader who had dis originally discovered Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib, uh, they got the gates of Arundha Sahib opened. Uh, the Sangat, the congregation, uh, the Shinori community space was at stake. Uh, even though, even though the Guru, uh, you know, even though the Guru did not uh, fight, he did not leave immediately either. Uh, the Guru probably let the situation, you know, escalate uh, uh, to the point where the faithfuls would, you know, learn about the incident. They will organize themselves and reclaim the community space. So a community space and an institution uh, so carefully nurtured over, you know, many decades or centuries uh, cannot be easily given away, you know. So it shows, you know, shows that, you know, that when the issue uh, issue can be resolved peacefully, amicably, without resorting to violence, the Guru actually used. And that if the issue is related to a community space or institution, then the Guru was a little adamant. And the Guru's response was more, more bold. So unlike in the you know, case of the Irma, the Guru took a slightly different approach, as I just mentioned, uh, you know, uh, in this case, yeah, we notice, you know, many such examples. I'm just giving you parallels so that we can take these, shatter these, you know, stereotypes about our different guru personalities that we create in our head based on, you know, just a few episodes, you know, connected to that particular group. So we notice many such examples of the gurus not giving up space uh, to indiv individuals when it comes to the institution. So whenever individuals undermined institutions, not the person, that's when the gurus took us. One such example is of a father and son duo, Pai Satta and Balwan. They used to do, you know, Kirtan, a devotional singing of Shabbat's, the hymns, the sixth scripture at the Guru Arjan Sahib's court, the fifth Guru. Uh, once Pai Satta, you know, sought financial help from the Guru for his daughter's marriage, and the Guru offered him donations uh, that the dev devotees would give uh, on that particular day. It just so happened that the offerings were really less. And both uh, father and son, you know, got offended. They stopped doing kirtan at the guru's court. Uh, uh, but the guru didn't really, uh, you know, follow them or request them to stay poor, because they had insulted the the institution, the the very idea of devotion. So you know, over time, just to just, just in the interest of time, I'll just shorten the the, the story. So the guru actually asked and inspired the congregation to actually not depend on individuals uh, who have who understanding of the music, but ask the Sangat, the congregation, the general community, to actually learn music and start doing kirtan devotional singing on their own so that they are not dependent on few 
you know, select individuals who know music. And so what happened is slowly people forgot about the father and son duo and they realized their mistake and they came back and asked for, for you know, pardon. So it just shows that, you know, whenever an institution is at stake, uh, the guru never compromised. So that's how the guru's uh, response changed based on what was there. So the next example, I'm gonna take uh, the third example is from the external world. And uh, it, it shows us how the guru responded to, you know, external discord. Uh, you know, at the time of Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib, the entire, you know, Northeast was uh, a part of the extended rule of the Mughals. Uh, Aurangzeb was sitting at the throne at that time. And Raja Ram Singh was the local king of one of the principalities of the Assam region. He well, happened to be a good friend of Guru uh, Tegh Bahadur Sahib. He accompanied Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib on his itineraries to Bengal. Uh, Raja Ram Singh is known in the history to have appeased, you know, appeased the emperor. Actually, Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib were, uh, you know, arrested a couple of times, actually three times, some sources say. So Raja Ram Singh was instrumental in getting Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib released in one of the times. So he happened to be a very good friend of uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib and he it was a sort of a devotee of, uh, of the guru. Uh, so, uh, you know, when the guru uh, was in his, on his missionary, you know, journeys, Aurangzeb used to get intelligence to the fact that the guru was, you know, politically active and was organizing communities around against the Mughal, uh, Mughal state. So uh, that's when, you know, he apprehended, uh, he got the sick arrested once. Uh, meanwhile, you know, during this time, a local tribe named Ahom attacked Guwahati and wrested control, you know, of the city. The leader of that tribe was named Monarch Krudhwaj. Uh, uh, so Aurangzeb appointed Raja Ram Singh to get the city back from the Ahoms. Uh, this is the same region where Kamrup fell uh, in Assam, which was known for its sorcery and black magic. So people were scared to, you know, venture into that region. So Ram Singh being aware of it, you know, sought the help of the Guru uh, to accompany him, you know, for this task. Yeah, and the Guru agreed. So both left for Dhaka uh, together in uh, December 1668 and they reached uh, Assam in 16, you know, 69. So as, you know, the forces under Ram Singh were approaching Guwahati, the own tribe, you know, sent a woman who did black magic, you know, to counter Ram Singh's army. Uh, uh, which was camped at Dubri, uh, a small river separated the woman and the and the Ram Singh's army. And the, the tradition recalls, uh, recalls that you know she tried to kind of you know use black magic against the, against the army. For she is said to have you know thrown a 26 feet long stone at the Guru and the army. Later, an uprooted tree as well, but nothing worked. Then finally, Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib shot an arrow, and the magic of the sorceress you know sort of died. And the entire tribe came and fell at the feet of the guru and asked for forgiveness. The guru, you know, assured them that he wasn't he wasn't an aggressor. He's, he he didn't mean harm, and that he was there to broker peace. And then after advising Ram Singh that you know he should not go to war with the homes, uh, the guru actually left for Bihar on a you know short sojourn. So, however, while the guru was not there. They, the both sides didn't listen to the guru and they actually prepared for war, uh, not hitting the guru's advice. And in the ensuing battle, Ram Singh's nephew was killed. He laid a prolonged siege to the Aham fort. Meanwhile, Ram Singh's son, who was in Aurangzeb's custody, whom Aurangzeb had kept as a security, uh, was killed by Aurangzeb. So when Ram, Ram Singh came to know about it, he turned his back on you know, Aurangzeb. In the meanwhile, you know, guru, Sahib returned from his uh, journey to Bihar. And when the Guru saw that there's an opportunity, he basically, basically sent an envoy to Ahoms uh, to broker peace between the two parties. So he used his diplomacy to bring about peace in Assam. Finally, a settlement was reached uh, due to the mediation and influence of the Guru on both sides. And as a result, the Guwahati uh, remained independent of the, the Mughal rule which is uh, the, the good part. As for the ag agreement, you know, the boundaries uh, were marked up uh, in the Guru's presence so that, you know, no side violated the other's territory. 
So since the armies, you know, were, you know, uh, you can see the picture right in front of you. Since the armies were, you know, both uh, spared bloodshed, they were extremely, you know, grateful. Uh, the peace settlement was, you know, celebrated uh, by a joint homage by both the armies to a previously built standing sh uh, shrine of Guru Nanak Sahib there. Um, a mound of peace was raised at that place in Dubri uh, with the red earth brought from both by both the armies from the adjoining areas. And the monument uh, still stands today, called actually the uh, Damadama site in Dubri. So all these, all, all this effort of, you know, Guru Sahib's mediation brought peace in Assam and Guwahati actually still remain independent of, you know, Mughal. So that's how the Guru used diplomacy in the external world to bring about peace without any fight. And we can find parallels of this uh, in Guru, you know, Hargobind Sahib's time when, you know, Guru Hargobind Sahib, you know, you know, reconciled with Emperor Jahangir, Jahangir after Jahangir had martyred uh, the fifth Guru Arjun Sahib, even though the hostile, the inherent hostile nature of the Mughal uh, state uh, never permanently changed. Uh, the relationship between uh, both the sides kept growing hot and cold, uh, Guru Arjun Sahib's, the sixth Guru Sahib's reign itself. But the point is, the Guru never let go of any opportunity to uh, bring about peace, whatever that meant. But not on the on the on the lines of peace. So principles were never abandoned uh, for bringing about peace. But peace was always preferred uh, if that could be brought about. So, uh, but even while you know there was peace, Guru uh, Six never shied away from confrontation with the Mughals, as is uh, you know visible in one of the fights and one of the battles that the Six had with the Mughals, even while there was peace in Rohila in 1621 in response to, you know, the Mughal military campaign against because Sikhs were getting more militarily, you know, stronger. And the Mughals saw the Sikhs as a threat. So, so additionally, you know, this idea of not compromising on principles is further echoed in the last example, which I'm showing you here uh, in the Guru's martyrdom itself. When the you know Emperor Aurangzeb started persecuting religious minorities, especially the Hindus, imposed unfair taxes on them and other minority communities, and started converting them forcibly, uh, the Kashmiri pundits approached the Guru, and the Guru assured them of of of, of his help, even though the Guru did not uh, endorse the ide ideology of the Brahmins. Uh, he told them that you know if the Emperor was able to convert the guru, all would, you know, voluntarily convert. The guru go actually got arrested for his statement and was taken uh, to Delhi and was given two options, uh, was given an option of pardon, uh, which involved, uh, which required him to convert to Islam. But the guru refused and chose martyrdom over conversion to espouse the, you know, the cause of, you know, freedom and liberty. So, this is this one episode in the guru's life everyone is aware of so i just wanted to bring this out and use this as an example because it contrasted with the guru's other uh, you know episode other episodes in the guru's life and which uh, sort of showed him in a very milder uh, color so so you know the question is what do we learn from this there are great learnings and lessons from the great gurus uh, responses to you know various situations of conflict uh, during the, uh, the, the Guru's reign in peacetime, his response to, as we have seen, to hostility, hostility sorry, consistently remained diplomatic and, you know, accommodating as long as the institutional sanctity of Sikhi principles was not, was maintained. His actions always, you know, upheld the universal principles of liberty and justice and the Guru's responses always remain dynamic, uh, depending on the issue at hand and, you know, you know what was at stake. On, you know, one is not to uh, take attacks and affronts personally and to learn to forgive. At times, there is a need for, you know, differentiating between whether an, an, an issue is about personal ego or one's dignity and sovereignty. More than the actual issue, most of the times it is usually 
the individual ego and stubborn uh, positions one takes that lead to you know you know escalation. So the guru teaches us that you know to you know to learn to keep our egos in check and work for the you know better betterment of everyone. But there is no room for compromise. There is no room for compromise. I decision to, you know, give us and Kashmiri Pandits uh, came to see the Gurus of the huge to escape forcible conversion. Even though, you know, the Guru did not strive to uh, the uh, we are encouraged to understand and you know uphold the universal principles of the right to life, liberty, faith, and expression at every cost. That is the you know the path and the essence of the rules message to uh, what it as today as a legacy. Thank you. Uh, with that, I uh, hand it over to you, Simranji. If there are any questions, we can take them now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Surin. Apology. Thank you for the, the presentation as well and sharing with us the various uh, facets of, uh, of uh, Guruji's life and the different dynamic nature and, uh, and uh, sort of uh, attitude that the Guru took to different situations. I think gave us a very, very uh, insightful view, view on how Guruji perceived different situations and, and addressed them very differently in different, different uh, uh, aspects. So one, 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 uh, there are a couple of questions that I have. Um, and for those who are, uh, uh, have been hearing and have been part of the webinar, if you have questions, please do uh, type in your questions in the Q&A tab right at the bottom. And maybe I can kick off some some that I had um, through the presentation and and get some insights from Surinderji as you write in your questions as well. So the first one, I think um, you you started off with uh, a mention about a very brief mention in terms of that name change of, of Guruji from uh, from Tiag Mal to uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur uh, uh, and uh, and and the Battle of Kartarpur. Maybe maybe. I think that's something that that is uh, one that is not as as known because as you as you had had shared the guru's personality has been one that is uh, been been seen to be very much introverted in nature uh, uh, introverted nature and one that is uh, more introspective in uh, in nature as well whereas the battle of Kutarpur sort of showed the valor uh, and bravery of of Guru Tegh Bahadur maybe you can give us a little bit more insights into that, that, that battle itself and what, what were the feats that Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji did that showed and demonstrated that, that, uh, that uh, valor and that bravery as well? Uh, the tradition specifically does not record exactly what happened in the battle, but it does record that uh, Guru showed exemplary valor in that uh, particular situation. Uh, the thing uh, that's interesting, which actually might be interesting to the viewers as well, which I actually didn't put in the slides because I would, would have slightly digressed, it was regarding the, the, the training and the education of the children during that time. You know, what really, you know, sometimes we just think that success is simply a straight line, whereas when we see it, successful people, but what we learn from you know older times is that success is not necessarily as simple or straight as we usually think. It, it all comes down to training. You know, during that time, you know, I I actually didn't have I didn't actually uh, include those slides there. But the education of children actually started as early as three years. They used to be taught literature. You know. Uh, martial art, music, and everything, and not just within the Guru's household, but even among the Mughals and the Hindu communities. Uh, kids used to be put to school in very early life, and by the age of six and seven, they used to be very proficient in so many other things, in language, literature, and music, and even martial arts, if their communities were engaged in those kind of courses. 
So the point is that you know many things which many times things which look very you know superhuman to us, they're not actually that superhuman. They're about you know training your mind and you know acquiring those skills that are required to actually appear or become super, uh, what we think is superhuman. So you know the guru also you know uh, we have an example of Guru Harkishan Sahib in front of who was uh, the guru at the age of age of age. And we sometimes think that, you know, eight is such a, uh, in a sense, young age, how can someone be a guru at the age of eight? But what we do not realize is that it's all about uh, education and training. Uh, earlier, our communities were really very serious about, you know, educating and training our kids. We are not that much nowadays. So that was one of the reasons that contributed to the guru being so all-rounder and dynamic in his personality, which included, you know, has feats with. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that, Sarindji. There's, um, there, there are a couple of questions that have just come in. So maybe let me let me uh, take one of them, and then I'll have one more question that I want to ask you as well. Um, so uh, this is from uh, Narushini. Uh, so she she asked um, a question that uh, it is a question of perception rather than what's right and wrong. How did people see the guru who has been to war, hunting, held in cap cap captivity? What was the perception of the Sikhs viewing the guru at that period of time? Uh, I just saw the question in front of me. I just, I'm um, sorry, I'm going to read it again just to be clear about what the question is. Uh, so uh, I have a question that is a question of a perception rather than what's right and wrong. How did people see a guru who was who has been to war, hunting, held in captivity. That's why right. that's a very interesting, important question because you know that's what the stereotypes are about. You know, when we say that spirituality is all about peace, but how does a spiritual person would respond if there is injustice in front of them and it requires them to you know raise their hands or arms or resort to violence? The question is not necessarily violence itself, or you know, because and I know in, in today's world, vegetarian, when vegetarianism is in, you know, ascendance, when, you know, veganism, vegetarianism, the idea of, you know, not killing animals and war is seen differently. The question is, how do you respond to a crisis situation where injustice is being inflicted on a party? How does a divinely person respond to that? And you know, now the ideas of sovereignty have changed quite a bit because sovereignty now, uh, you know, rests with the elected governments. But 400 years back, the model was very different. And that, at that time, we didn't even have this proper sense of justice that we have now. Just to give you a perspective, you know, women didn't, didn't even have the right to, you know, vote in, uh, in the U.S. just a century ago. So what was what's what's uh, what's considered to be a right right now wasn't necessarily a right hundred or two hundred years ago. This the the world was very different. And what the guru taught us is that as divinely beings, as someone who is who has the divine within them, every person has the potential to you know experience divine. So as a virtue of having the divine within them, every person is sovereign. So they are you know expected to act as sovereign. And which requires them to even resort to, uh, you know, you know, extreme things that we that seem extreme now, uh, in the uh, you know, just I mean, just to deliver, you know, justice and you know equality in this. Hopefully that answers it. Sure, um, I think uh, one one important aspect that you that you um, alluded to during the the presentation was how. Guru Sahib dealt with complex relationships, be it family, be it animosity, be it uh, uh, injustice. And are there common threads that 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 uh, are there in those in those instances that we in contemporary times can actually still follow? Yes, obviously that well, one common thread is I think of personal interests and ego. So if, if and when we learn to segregate our personal interests and egos from the actual issue, and if we start looking at uh, things from uh, 
from the principal angle, we would be able to identify, we would be able to, you know, uh, decide our responses to, uh, uh, to various situations in, in, a, in a more harmonious manner. No, thanks. Thanks for that, to energy. You're you're absolutely right. I mean, I think sometimes it's about addressing um, the ego as well as to be able to understand um, the nature of the relationship itself to be able to navigate it much better. Um, and and I think that we have got another question here. Um, so this is from Sandeep Singh, and uh, he says that uh, you had mentioned some of the extraordinary feats by the gurus. Uh, that has come uh, by the gurus come down to actually having formalized and robust training in different fields. His question is to uh, my question is generic to the the miracle stories that we have heard of our Sikh gurus. For example, Guru Nanak uh, stopping the stone with his hand, um, and he was asking, "What is your view on this? And uh, is that is it then a superpower or simply an issue of mind over matter?" Um, in, in, in those stories. And I think you mentioned one more in, in your presentation as well. Um, so so I, I guess I think this is, a, this, this is one that, that um, a lot of uh, younger people and younger folks um, do think uh, quite, and, and those who have now look at it in a very logical feel, um, you know, some of these uh, stories, uh, uh, are they are they a matter of of uh, of fact one, uh, or are they uh, metaphorical, or are they part and parcel of the training and the robust training that the gurus have had had uh, yeah. had got during the early times? And let me address that. So there are multiple ways to look at these episodes. One is of a faithful, and the other one is obviously the one that you gave. So the from a Sikh perspective, obviously. Gurbani tells us that, obviously that you are aware of the Sikh tradition. Uh, Gurbani tells us that, you know, the Guru is capable of doing every, anything and everything. So keeping that in mind, uh, we, uh, uh, since uh, within the Sikh tradition, the Guru is not necessarily just the human personality of the Guru, but the wisdom that is actually contained within the Guru. So keeping that in mind, as uh, Simranji just alluded, Many a times, uh, you know, stories, uh, the narratives are actually anecdotal or they have symbolism in them and they might not necessarily hold the truth. But for us, Sikh is actually, uh, sorry, the Guru is actually capable of doing everything. So when you, it's up to you how you take that story. But what do you want to focus on? Do you want to focus on the miracle or do you want to focus on the message of the Guru in that narrative? So it's up to you. Uh, do you want to, sometimes, sometimes people just get fixated on the point whether the Guru actually did it or not. But the, but for us faithful like us, for Sikhs like us, for the Guru, the actual point is not whether the Guru did that or not, but what was the reason behind the Guru doing that? Or what is the message hidden in the Guru's actions? That's more important than actually finding, because actually nobody can tell what happened and what didn't. Most of the things are the, most, most of these things are actually you know, anecdotal in nature, and they contain a lot of uh, symbolism, and they are I, they have you know many hyperboles. Yeah. Yep. No, thanks for that, Surinderji. And I and I think that just just as an extension to that, I think a lot of time um, the message, as you said, resonates and and is more important than than the story. The story is a means to the end, but not the end itself. And it's really the message and the takeaway that you get um, and imbibe in the values that you bring in that is more important. Um, I think there was there's 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 uh, somebody who's really interested uh, on the painting that you had in your last slide, um, and uh, and uh, and 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 also wants to know about the date on the painting itself. Um, and I think some of the Im images that you had was actually quite 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 interesting. So so so, so maybe that's something that we can do at the end uh, of the presentation, and uh, IHC can also. Uh, sort of uh, take it up in terms of which are some of the paintings that you had and some of the references of where the paintings are currently. Yeah, sure. So, so we can have that as well. Um, I, I had one more question that may, maybe not covered in your, in, your, in your presentation, but very important, at least in my view, uh, when we look and talk about Guru Tegh Bahadurji. And, and I think a lot of that is pertaining to the Bani of Guru Tegh Bahadurji. And uh, a lot of the Bani that uh, Guru Tegh Bahadurji, I think there are about 115 or 116 
uh, uh, hymns that was was done by uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji and Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Um, a lot of it is is in a uh, in Punjabi they say Bairag in a in a in a uh, in a, uh, in a uh, uh, sort of a message of of, uh, of of detachment and and a little bit somber in uh, in in nature as well. Um, so I wanted to understand a little bit more on 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 the Bani and the contributions of Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji with the Bani in uh, in uh, in in the script in six scriptures. Maybe some some thoughts on that, Surinder. Yeah, sure. Actually, you know, uh, it's it's really good that you actually brought that up because the Research Institute is actually working on a project uh, named the Guru Granth Sahib project, and we are we are actually undertaking and you know doing the like, commentaries on the Guru Granth Sahib the scripture uh, from uh, uh, both in English and Punjabi right now. So uh, you guys can definitely go and uh, take benefit from it. Uh, we are actually right now doing of Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib since it's the 400th uh, birth anniversary of Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib. Just finished sloks by the Guru and we right now we're doing nine shows by uh, the Guru as well. So, you know, this question comes up quite a bit. And as I mentioned, I alluded to this in the, in the beginning that I, it just so happens that uh, Guru's revelation is seen as having a tone which is very, you know, very personal and very uh, detached from the word. But honestly, if you look at the Bani's of the other Gurus, the revelations of the other Gurus, they contain exactly the same message, which is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that you need to understand that your stay in this world is temporary. You're not here uh, permanently. You need to recognize your origin. You need to know what, is, what lies at, at your core and then connect with that and know that all the pleasures of the body and in this world are only going to give you disease and you know misery. The only way to achieve you know eternal peace, happiness, and bliss is to actually connect with your source, which is the divine who has created everything. Once you realize this and do that, that's when you will achieve the actual bliss. This is the crux. This is the essence of the Guru's message, which is actually echoed by all the gurus. The only difference is in the tone. Sometimes the verbiage is different. Uh, also because, you know, the, this, this view might also be because of the fact that Guru Sahib's Bani is in Raj and it might have a certain tonality, which, tone, tone, which is different from the revelations of the other ones. But essentially, honestly speaking, the message of all the Gurus, the revelation of all the Gurus is essentially the same. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you, Surinderji. I mean, I think that's, that's imp uh, insightful and definitely looking forward to um, the... Uh, the 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 Sri Guru Sahib project that you're putting in place and uh, being able to 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 get more enlightenment there. Um, I think you know it's uh, uh, there's one more sorry that I think there's one more question that just popped up on the chat. Uh, maybe let me address that as well, uh, just so that you know we 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 are right at the top of the hour and so that we can uh, then close out the session. I think uh, Amrit just told a question here was. Um, I have a question regard related to Guruji's character characteristics. Is there any insight on why Guru chose seclusion and contemplation in Bakala? I'm wondering if there there is any relation to the Guru's experience during the Battle of Kartarpur, which I've read was the first and only battle that he fought. Uh, well, that's exactly uh, the the. The question that we dealt in today's presentation that that's what exactly we are countering that what we see as seclusion uh, and contemplation might not necessarily be seclusion and this idea of contemplation is if we are trying to you know uh, credit this idea of contemplation to just the guru the ninth guru then that would be a mistake because every guru was inward looking in that sense as far as this idea of seclusion is concerned, there might be logical reasons. For instance, you know, uh, there's a line of the Guru's going at that time, there's Guru Harai Sahib and then Guru Harkrishan Sahib and then, uh, you know, Guru. But, but that's not the point. The point is, you know, if you look at the uh, evidence available in the Sikh texts, we notice that the Guru actually didn't choose to live a secluded life. 
Guru was actually very active. If you remember the very first slide from Yani Gyan Singh that we had quoted, it said that the Guru actually served the community in Makala. So he was very active. There are other anecdotes and uh, examples and evidences available where we know that the Guru was in touch with actually the Sikh community at large uh, through his, I'm forgetting, his brother-in-law or someone. I don't remember exactly, but there are sources available that tell me, tell us that, you know, the Guru was very active. He went on hunting expeditions. He went on horse riding. He served the community locally. He was in touch with the larger Sikh world through different em emissaries and his relationships. So this very idea of, you know, him being, uh, choosing to stay in seclusion is something that we're trying to follow. Yeah, I think, I think Surinderji, you also mentioned earlier that it was actually on the request of Guru Har Gobind Sahib Ji as well. So in, yeah. in, in essence, it was also the hukam of the Guru at that time to go to, Bak to Bakala and to be able to stay there. And so there's, there's also divine knowledge in that space that it was uh, uh, following on the hukam of the Guru itself. That's why Guru Teg Bahadur Ji actually resided in Bakala. Um, I, I, there's one more question. I know we are at the top of the hour already. And, um, and, and maybe what, what we can do is we can answer that question. Um, uh, and uh, I, I mean, we'll pass that on to Surinderji and if you can maybe type that up and then we can, we can address that directly with the person um, uh, separately as well. Um, with that, I thank you, uh, Surinderji, for your insight, insights on the fascinating life of Guru Teg Bahadurji. Um, and uh, I, I, I hand it over back to Malvika to uh, give us the, the ending and the closing of the, the session. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Surinderji, for really uh, taking us on a very insightful um, journey through you know, the life and the, the major events that really gives us um, a un greater understanding of Guru Tegh Bahadurji and uh, you know, his personality and, of course, his legacy as well. And uh, thank you, Simran, as well, for, for um, bringing our further aspects and to our audience, of course, for a very lively and engaging discussion, which I hope we can, we can carry on. If you do have any, any further questions, you can always write into uh, IHC and we can link you up with uh, Surinderji uh, as well. So um, with this, we come to an end of, of today's uh, talk. Um, as this is a monthly series until September, uh, do watch out for updates via email, um, as well as our PTICs and Facebook pages. Um, Sikhs in Singapore, a story untold, uh, is now on display at the Indian Heritage Center uh, until the 30th of September. So please uh, try and visit us as well. Thank you and goodbye.